Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth one of these resource videos for Physics 117. So you might have been trying to put this as far out of your minds as you possibly can but the end is coming. The end of the course is a few weeks away and with the end of the course looms the final exam for this course and probably many of the other courses you're doing as well. So what I wanted to focus on in this video is ways in which you can prepare yourself to succeed in the high stakes examinations at the end of this course and other courses. So we're going to focus on three sort of practical strategies or three areas uh, around which you can support and build for success in the exam. And these are around practice, specifically how you practice, uh, strategies for solving problems, right? You've been solving problems for weeks, but let's think about how you approach solving problems. Uh, and finally, how you organize what you know. Now, first of all, practice. All throughout this course, we've been highlighting the importance of practice uh, uh, in how you get good at something and, and in the context of this course that's how you get good at solving uh, how you get good at solving physics problems but it turns out that as important as practice itself is what's equally important is how you practice and there's this this sort of term that's used for how experts get good at something is not just by the amount of practice, but it's something that's called deliberate practice. So it's taking deliberate actions to improve your learning or whatever it is you're trying to get good at. And the sorts of things that deliberate practice or deliberate actions look like, the sorts of things that they are in the context of this course, uh, are things like actually doing it, not just watching or reading, but you know, it's this whole idea again of learning as a contact sport, you have to actually do it. Uh, and doing it for real, right? And, and by for real, I mean uh, doing it timed, right? Because your final exam is a timed assessment. You don't have as much time um, as you might think. Right? So being able to do something to time, and again, free from distractions, uh, is an important way of being deliberate about how you practice. And also practice with, uh, with another aspect actually of doing it for real is not being tempted to uh, flip to the back of the book to look up the answer, or just click through the hints until you get the answer revealed. Right? Um, and the final one there, practice with uh, accountability. So if you're going to do something uh, and commit to doing it before you meet up with someone in a study group or with a buddy or, you know, to try and work through the, uh, the, the problem. So it's practice with, uh, with accountability. Now, just to remind you, uh, this was a slide from the very first one of these resource videos. Uh, mistakes will happen. And I hope by now you're getting a little bit more comfortable than maybe you were at the start of this course with the idea of making mistakes and, and learning from them. Um, not all mistakes involve you coming over the handlebars, right, figuratively. Uh, some mistakes look like this. You get into a problem and you realize you're at a dead end, you can't solve it, right? You need to be able to back out and to get to the point where hopefully you can identify where you took the wrong turn, right? So, you know, mistakes aren't just falling off, they can be dead ends. They can also be, as you've now probably seen in this course, there can be more than one way to actually solve a problem. You can make your life somewhat easier or somewhat more difficult as to how you go about solving a problem. So an example that we will have seen, uh, we have already seen, is you know you can make your life easy using conservation of energy to solve a problem, where resolving forces and thinking about torques and things like that would have made life very, very complicated for you. So another sort of mistake might be 
taking the hard route, right? It's not always a bad thing if you fancy a bit of a challenge, but uh, there may be an easier and therefore a simpler and quicker way that's less prone to you making a mistake to, uh, to solve the problem. And, and just to complete this set of depressing photos, uh, you know, sometimes this happens as well. Uh, and it feels really good when you, when you struggle with a problem and there's the, the sort of joy of working it out or the, the, the joy of solving it. So that's a kind of upside of, uh, of practice that sometimes that will happen as well. So that's the first key idea. Not all practice is equal and when you practice you should expect mistakes and dead ends and occasionally coming over the handlebars. Uh, the second idea is about problem solving and more specifically what to do when you don't know what to do. And I'm sure you've all had this experience at some point. You've looked at a problem and thought, I have absolutely no idea how to start this. Um, some people would say that when you don't know how to start something, that really is a problem as opposed to an exercise or just kind of you know, going through the motions, put the numbers in, turn the handle, get the answer out at the end. A real problem is where you have to figure out what you need to do, how you're going to do it, and then actually, uh, actually do it. And so thinking about a strategy that will enable you to make headway into a problem, even if when you first look at it, there's not, it's not immediately clear how you're going to solve this. And we've talked about this previously in the course, but I just want to reinforce it here. This kind of four-step strategy, um, get started. So the sorts of things you would do to get started, uh, it sounds very school level, but draw a diagram, right? Visually represent the scenario that the problem is talking about, right? Because you can, what you're doing is you're actively translating the written words of the question into a different representation. So that helps you understand and kind of get the problem fixed in your mind. Um, and, and figure out what it is you're being asked to calculate, right? And in order to be able to calculate that, there may be things along the way that you need before you can get to that final, uh, that final answer. So that's the sort of thing with, with get started. Next step is, is devise a plan. Um, you understand the problem statement, you have it visualized. Think about what aspect of physics, what law, what principle, what conservation law you are going to need to invoke in order to be able to solve the problem. What bit of the course are we asking you about here? And when you've identified that, uh, you can devise a plan for how you're going to work towards the answer or the answer to each part. So that would be, think about the conservation law or the area of physics and then represent that in mathematical or equation form. So that's formulating the plan. Know how you're going to go from the problem statement to the solution. Execute the plan, actually work it through. It may be algebraic, in which case you'll end up with an algebraic expression. It may be numerical, in which case you'll end up with a numerical answer. Uh, and then finally, and please don't skip this step, evaluate the result. Ask yourself, if it's a numerical quantity that you've calculated, does this number make sense? because it is really easy to make a mistake in the execution stage, right? You convert meters to kilometers the wrong way, right? So instead of dividing by a thousand, you multiply by a thousand. Uh, you would be amazed how under conditions of, of sort of moderate stress, like an exam, students will happily turn in papers that say, uh, you know, in 40 seconds, the truck travels a distance of 567 kilometers. It's like, really? Right? And it, it's often something trivial, like you've lost a factor of a thousand or you've done a misconversion of units. But if you get into the habit of evaluating your result at the end, hopefully you're going to recognize that, that, you know, that distance in 40 seconds or whatever it was is, is 
not feasible and you've made a mistake somewhere and you need to backtrack uh, and figure it out. So strategies for solving a problem. If you try and apply these four steps, it should allow you to make some headway into problems, even if on the first read you don't automatically know how you're going to be able to, uh, to solve this. So that's the second idea. Uh, and the final big idea is about organizing your knowledge, organizing what you know, how your knowledge and understanding on the course is organized. Now, you're probably thinking about organizing your knowledge in terms of putting your notes neatly in a binder, organized week by week by week. Uh, but it's more subtle than that. And, you know, we haven't really helped you with that because we've pre presented the material in a linear fashion, week by week by week. Um, and this is important, or at least thinking about how you organize your knowledge is important because how you organize your knowledge influences your ability to be able to apply what you know and whether or not something sticks. And the idea is if you have an organized, coherent framework of knowledge, it's easier to access and activate that knowledge to put it to use than if <clears throat> you know your your organizational structure for knowledge is isolated facts here and here jumbled disconnected you know it's like a sheaf of papers just thrown on the floor here's a schematic that that might help you in thinking about this and it highlights the differences between experts at something uh, and, and novices or learners. And the idea is that experts have these rich, meaningful knowledge structures. They're not just isolated linear facts. Uh, and what that does is it supports learning and application. Whereas novices, on the other hand, tend to build, right, not all the time, but tend to build what are characterized as sparse or superficial knowledge structures, right? How does that relate to Newton's third law? Oh, okay, I remember, we did that in week six, right? Well, that doesn't really tell you much about how Newton's third law fits in its place in this course, other than chronologically when we happen to cover that material, right? So the idea about building uh, knowledge structures is important. And we've presented it linearly, but I'd encourage you to try different ways of representing how the bits of the course are connected. And the next two slides are examples of concept maps of topics in introductory mechanics courses that they're actually um, from sources on the internet. I'll put the links in the description as always. It gives you something to start from, right? So I'm not challenging you to do this with a completely blank page. It gives you one to sort of start from and think, you know, how do I want to change this for, uh, for me? So here they are. Uh, depending on what size screen you're looking at this, this may look great or terrible. Um, but as I say, the links will be in the description. Um, the way this concept map is organized is it presents the, the two big ideas or big topics from a course in, in dynamics and waves on either side, in blue and red. So blue is translation, right? Things moving. Um, red is rotation. And there's, you know, comparable boxes that are the analogs, rotational or translational analogs of each. And then down the middle, we have the interactions and the forces that cause or bring about these different types of motion. Um, and if you go right down to the bottom line, then what you find are five big ideas that really cover most of the topics within this course. So we have principles about conservation of velocity, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and then conservation of velocity and momentum for angular motion. 
Here's the second example. It, it's very similar, right? It came from the same, uh, from the same group, but it takes a, a slightly more formula-based approach. But it has essentially the same organization. It categorizes, you know, what are we interested in? What's the system? What's causing the change? What model do we have? What is the thing that's constant? So what's the conserved quantity uh, in this case? Now, these are pretty good starting points. But those of you with, with keen eyes or good resolution screens will have noticed that there's nothing on here about oscillations or waves. That said, it's a really nice compact organization that I think can help you organize your thoughts. And so here's my challenge to you in the last one of these videos. I would encourage you to work to develop your own map, something like this that is a representation of how the bits of the course fit together. I'd share it with others. You might want to work on it collaboratively with some of your peers. You might want to ask questions on Piazza. You might want to bring it to, to office hours. And if we get to the point where we have really, really good ones, and there might be multiple really good ones because there's no right answer to how you do this, Right? There's right ways to connect things, but you can represent it in any number of ways. If we get to the point where there are really, really good ones, what I might ask is, is the authors of this consider applying an open license like a Creative Commons license to it, uh, and so I can use it and we can use it in future versions of this course as a tool for, uh, for other students. Whether or not we get to that point, um, this, I think, would still be valuable for some of you to put in your learning log. It might be the type of thing you want to take in as a resource into the exam to be able to sort of help sort out through that problem solving strategy, which bit of physics is it that we're actually talking about in, uh, in a given problem. So a different way of thinking about how the bits of the course fit together and you've got a few weeks to think about this and actually put it into action before uh, we get to the end of the course and the exam. So this is the last one of these videos that we've got planned. Uh, they're new for this year on the course. It's our attempt to do something kind of in parallel with the actual physics content of the course to try and support students learning. Uh, as always, happy to receive people's comments and feedback on them, ways in which you think they could be improved, uh, opportunities for, for creating other ones as well. So if you feel like it, please do let in, get in touch and let us know. And if you've stuck with all five of these, then thanks for watching.